and what technology and market trends are driving the need for high density, high performance solutions in the data center. Here to answer that question is Brad Booth, Principal Engineer at Microsoft, and also Franklin Flint, Telecom Strategist at Dell. And Franklin and Brad, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Franklin, of course, you've been on the show uh, a number of times, and Brad, it's, it's great to have you here. Thank you. I had the opportunity, Brad, if I may, uh, to listen to your presentation at TIA's Data Center Workshop just moments ago. I uh, got a lot of good uh, milk and crannies, if you don't mind <laughs> me saying that. I'm going to incorporate those into our interview, our, our short interview today. So, awesome. Um, just to let you know, Franklin, I'll start with you. I talked at the top of the show about these market trends mm -hmm. and what's driving these technologies in the data center. Is it the discussion around speed and capacity as far as 100 or 40, 100, and even 400G? Um, those are important discussions to have, uh, but what's driving everything is how people are using their data and using their, their uh, applications and services. The, the market has changed, and that was brought up earlier in, in, during the workshop, to where it, activities are being driven by the consumer. What are people trying to do with their phones or with their computers or with their data or the way they want to consume their services that they get from the world? And that's things like video and putting the data they generate, be it their own videos or their own pictures or the documents that they create out on the cloud to access from wherever they want. It's ubiquitous access to your mailboxes, to your data, to everything. So there's this big need to meet their requirements, right? So how you build your data center, how you build your cabling plant, how you build out your thing is based on what the consumers are going to demand from you. And of course, video is one of the big things driving that. So with video, it's about bandwidth, 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 bandwidth. And that's one of the things that, that uh, we have to deal with. So obviously, you have to consider all that stuff, but the trend is more and more and more. And no analyst can predict what it's going to be coming in the future. Uh, Brad, as I mentioned in your presentation, yeah. I, I did take some notes and I, you talked about five key elements that you have to uh, be prepared for and be aware of in the data center and in, within those five elements. Uh, there's something that you call the five-year crop rotation. What is that? Well, we call it a crop rotation and, and it's not necessarily five years. It actually depends on how fast you want to amateurize that equipment. You know, obviously IRS has guidelines as to how fast you can amateurize the equipment. But we look at it as we have areas within our data centers where we bring in uh, computers and deploy computers, uh, servers, and then we will, six months later, deploy new ones. And then six months later, deploy some more as we build out a data center. So a data center isn't built as, you know, here's the building and we just suddenly load it full of servers. It's actually we bring servers in because We've got manufacturers that have to build these and have to ship them to us. And then we have engineers that are scheduled to put these in and then they bring up the service. So the crop rotation is as we bring on a service, uh, bring up a, a set of servers, we may be actually look, moving new servers into that same data center facility. And as the second one's being brought up, we'll bring in a third one. And then as that third one's being brought up, that might be three years time frame that maybe that first one we put in is going to be refreshed again. And so we continually rotate the crop, so we're always using the best uh, performing computers that we can get at the best price. So what happens is you're getting a really good bandwidth efficiency out of it, you're getting a really good performance efficiency. So you know they, they say, right, the computer technology in three years changes so radically. And so that's why we try to use that type of a refresh cycle to make sure that our customer's experience is always on fairly new equipment. Uh, equipment that you know they may not be able to deploy in their own data centers, but that we can deploy quickly. Franklin, uh, and just a nice segue from the crop rotation, if, if you don't mind, I'm using that term. Is that, by the way, <laughs> is that an industry term, or is that something? That um, you it's deploy? something that we use in Microsoft a lot. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right, good to know. Uh, 100, 100 gigabit Ethernet data center. What what to look out for? And I know there's a number of things. There's cost, security. There's uh, power consumption, uh, bandwidth. Are those the top four? You would say? Uh, those are the big ones. I think cost plays one of the biggest ones. You have to have a business model that justifies uh, building it out that way. Obviously, it's a new standard. Uh, it, it's not hasn't been commoditized yet. There isn't a mass market for devices and components available yet. But as that grows out, um, it becomes more cost effective to look at it and, and to look for solutions in that area. But you do, you have to balance the, the cost of the cabling itself. You have to choose which kind of cabling you want to do. You want to do multi-mode, you want to do single mode. You have to look at uh, what kind of distances you're going to be running across. You have to look at your uh, what the servers are going to be generating, whether you need that kind of bandwidth all the time in every aspect of the network or just in certain areas like connecting building to building or connecting between uh, racks of, uh, rows of servers. So it really comes down to a lot of uh, thought into all aspects of that, but really it's the ROI on the investment. 
do you want to invest in what you're going to be using for the next five years, or do you want to invest in what you're going to be using for the next 10 years? And that really becomes a serious question you have to think about. Brad, uh, Franklin just talked about multi-mode fiber versus single-mode fiber. Of course, uh, they could be interchangeable. They could be used in different circumstances. One's more expensive than the other. When do you use them? Well, a lot of cases, uh, for us, it's actually driven by a length of time that we're going to use that uh, fiber in that installation. and. Uh, you know, what are our reach requirements? When you're building a, a hyperscale or mega scale data center, you generally have fairly long reaches. And so that reach between those switch equipment can be quite, quite far. And we look at it from the point of view when we put in this, we use a lot of single mode fiber in our core infrastructure. When we get down to close to the servers, you know, we use, uh, we can use multi-mode fiber, we can use single-mode fiber, whatever is the lowest cost at, at that implementation. But in the core of our network where our reaches are significantly above what multi-mode fiber can accomplish, we are predominantly single-mode fiber in that reach. And it's, it's because it's the only cost-effective solution there. Franklin, I want to stay on the cost uh, issue for, for these data centers. Um, Stephen Chang of Google talked about transceiver solutions. First of all, tell our audience what that is, but number two, um, Tell us about the construct of these data centers as far as having maybe 10, 10 gig servers as opposed to one 100 gig server. What are the, what are the advantage or disadvantage of that? Sure, so um, I'm gonna do a very basic description of what a transceiver is because I'm not an electrical engineer, but a transceiver is the device that connects between the device, be it a um, switch or a server, uh, and the cable itself that plugs into it. So you have different kinds of transceivers for different kind of cabling solutions and you plug into a 10 gigabit port that could be multi-mode, could be single mode, uh, it could even be copper. And that's basically what a transceiver is. I think it's a fairly good description yeah. of yeah. that. Um, so you have to look at that as part of the total cost of building your data center, right? Because the data center, especially these super huge hyperscale ones that you see from Google and, and Microsoft, um, there are so many transceivers that have to be purchased. You have to take into account how much they cost, how much power they consume, how easy they are to install and maintain. Um, what the life expectancy is of them, all those things have to be taken into account as part of your decision process. It's not just looking at, it's something to hook up a cable to and I'll just get what I can. You have to actually think about it. Um, but when you start talking about the servers themselves, uh, you have a lot of options on how you connect those things and they're getting more dense and more power efficient and more processing rich where you have you know, 100x the performance in a server today than you had five or six years ago. Um, there becomes more need to get significantly more throughput in and out of those servers. Now, some applications don't require a huge amount of throughput. In, in fact, in some cases, you can't get data in and out of it because maybe you're talking to a traditional spinning hard drive as a primary use of the server as a storage device. You can only move so much data on and off of that spinning hard drive. And so having a super high-speed link in and out of the server might not make a lot of sense. On the other hand, you might be in a situation where you're doing real-time you know, switching and, and fabric-based activities like in an SDN or in a uh, network function virtualization environment where throughput is super important and line speed performance becomes important. And things like 100 gig or even 400 gig in the future become very important. Um, in the near term, most people are happy with 10 gig. A lot of people are happy with still multiple 1 gig links. Uh, but you're going to start seeing you know, uh, 40 gig become more common, 100 gig is on the horizon, and then there's a new technology with the 25 gig possibly coming in as a new efficient way of, of connecting servers into the network. Now, a big part of the conversation uh, during the workshop earlier was on compute. Of course, that's the, the server itself. But you also talked a lot about storage. If you, and Brad will ask you this, if you were to combine or converge storage resources and compute the server, would that eliminate the need for network-based technologies? No, I mean, those. we already combine uh, a lot of the storage and compute. We have actually what we call a storage server and a compute server. A compute server just simply performs a specific application function. It doesn't actually have a ton of storage built into it because it's not operating as a storage server. And so that device typically runs a slower network link. Our storage servers, which are moving larger volumes of data, customer data that, that they have, that is actually a uh, currently, you know, a 40 gig link and will progress to become a 50 gig link eventually because of the volume of information. So there's, for us, there's actually almost two types, two SKUs of servers that we have. One that focuses on the low end compute and another that focuses on the high end storage. Now, of course, there's a number of data center architectures in Franklin, um, and not to do a product pitch really, but the active fabric architecture, what, what, what is that? 
Uh, so Dell, uh, several years ago, we did acquire Force 10 several years ago, and we've integrated them into our product line. And uh, we, we acquired them because they have a very lovely way of approaching um, the network and how to solve problems, and they, and they have a very open standards approach to the network. And so one of the things that they said was, we can, can take all of this vertical stack, very high-end, complex architectures for connecting things together, and instead go to more affordable mass volume type switching technologies that build a fabric across your data center. So instead of having one big hyper-connected frame switch solution that everything plugs into, uh, you can have dozens and dozens of single rack space uh, switches. Now, in order to pull that off, you have to be able to control all those switches as if they're one switch. So even though they're distributed physically and they're distributing the processing physically across the data center, you're connecting them all together um, as if they're one big switch. And then you have to be able to manage those as one switch. You have to be able to, um, to program them. You have to be able to set up your network connections. You need to be able to, on the fly, move them around. So Dell has adopted an active fabric approach, which is you have a fabric that you can build your data center on and around. And then you have uh, management tools and controllers that can set up and operate all of those network connections and, and configure your switches to work that way. The next big leap is to go to SDN where the applications themselves, the orchestrators that run the cloud, can set up the network on the fly uh, without any user interface at all. And that's really the direction things are going. And we're huge proponents of that. And we think the industry is adopting it as well. There's a lot of open standards that are driving into that, um, such as OpenFlow and Open Daylight, and there are others out there. And, and we're adopting support for all of those. Uh, we believe that there, when there's competition on those technologies that leads to greater innovations, uh, lower cost for solutions for our customers, and uh, in the long run, easier uh, implementation for everybody. So it's about taking complex solutions and trying to make them simple and affordable for our customers. Brad, if I'm a customer and I come to Microsoft and I say I want to outsource my data center services to you guys, what is the biggest cost that I would incur? Is it power? Uh, the biggest cost you probably would incur is actually for some of these guys is, is to actually analyze what you need to have to be able to offload your services. You know, what do you want to move to? Um, a lot of people, for example, are moving to an Office 365. And in doing so, in moving their services off of using their own data centers for all their Outlook and all that kind of stuff, they're moving that over to manage, have that hosted in the Microsoft Cloud. And part of that is, is what is the bandwidth coming out of your own network? You know, if you normally had a very fast network internally, but a slow network out to the real world, you probably need to look at, at changing that network speed so you can get into the cloud faster. Um, but we're also looking at can we, instead of bringing your data center over into ours, can we provide you equipment? So now there's partnerships that we've done where you can actually buy an Azure platform and load it into your own data center, and then you connect to the cloud for some of the other applications and things that you need. So there's, there's different models that can come into play with this, and, and it all depends on what the customer feels fits into their budget and what fits into their needs. I know we could talk a lot, of, a lot further about costs as far as CapEx costs and OpEx costs yeah. in the data center. We could talk about that for a, number, uh, or for, for a good while today anyway. Um, but we do have to get back to the workshop. I don't want to make you guys late, so I'll cut this short, and we'll, of course, hopefully talk uh, very soon about uh, data center network designs and cabling and so forth. So we appreciate your time and being here. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.